Okay, so uh, today we start with this uh, special lecture called Literature in Mathematical Science, which we initiate in uh, CMSA in Harvard. But also, we de I decide to also connect with ICCM, which means uh, we are connecting with quite a few universities across uh, the world, including a few in China, Tsinghua University, Morning Science Institute, Academy of Science, and Chinese Science <coughs> and Technology, uh, and Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, Sun University, and also we are connecting with trying to connect with Columbia, UCLA, and several other universities. So we decided that uh, we could, because of Zoom meeting, we could uh, learn things from each other uh, long distance. And I think this has been doing quite well. Um, so uh, the talk would be on the, some important events in the history of mathematics, science, and uh, you hope, uh, we hope to uh, get uh, the beginners or even experts to understand the subject much better uh, by looking at the history, by looking on, on what actually happens. And some of them may have some new idea that we, uh, by learning it. I, I learned um, many of the, my own subject geometry uh, in that way, which I feel very fascinating by knowing what the great man has done. So um, I actually gave a talk about Chen uh, a, a couple, uh, about a month ago, but that was only rather informal. So I probably will give a talk again about that. So formally, today's talk is the first of all these uh, talks. And uh, so Professor Don Lubin, who used to be in Harvard, now in Tsinghua University as a full-time faculty there. And we, of course, are very proud of him. And he is a great man and the leader of the whole subject in statistics. And we'd like to have uh, Don to say about what his own experience is and what he knows about statistics. Don. Well, thank you very much, yeah, Professor Yao, for the uh, gracious introduction. And I, I, I certainly look forward to uh, hearing your, your lectures. So now let me see if, this is the first time I've ever done uh, Zoom. So It'll, it'll probably be a little bumpy, but I hope I, I, I get it uh, basically okay. So I, I guess I go here to start video, is that right? Okay, fine. <clears throat> well, I'd like to uh, uh, begin by, by, by thanking Yao for this opportunity to, to, to give this lecture and also for the uh, gracious introduction and also Ryan for uh, uh, trying to teach me how to, how to learn this with, with in a short amount of time. So this is my uh, first ever uh, Zoom lecture, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to try. And this, this, this talk will be um, a very sort of personal one that's uh, also not at all technical. And it really arose out of conversations that that Yao and I have had over the uh, uh, past couple of years, uh, why do separate departments of statistics exist? <clears throat> and then uh, will they survive? Uh, and so it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a perspective that uh, from, from, from my viewpoint, and it's not necessarily accurate, and I'll say uh, a few more things about that shortly. It is a uh, historical question in some sense, why do separate statistics departments exist? <clears throat> uh, but, I, but I have to say that uh, I'm DBR Donald Bruce Rubin is no Steve Stigler. I mean, Steve is, I, I was a colleague of his at the University of Chicago for a, a few years and, and a co-editor of, of JAZZ, Journal of the American Statistical Association, uh, years before that. <clears throat> And, and he has books on this, and he has not only books that he's written, but he collects books. And so he's a real master of such questions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to try to be, be uh, fully accurate. Uh, but there, there is a, uh, a viewpoint that I have that I think is, can be interesting. Uh, and the, the reason is statistics is a, is a very young discipline, uh, certainly relative to mathematics departments. <clears throat> and given the length of, of the discipline, I'm a relative dinosaur. I've been around for uh, many, many years. 
And as a result, I knew many of the sort of the founders of the field, and as a result, heard many old war stories I, uh, about the early days and why departments were were uh, uh, founded. <clears throat> And this is gonna be more a, a story about some of those people and why I think separate departments were really uh, founded based on, on conversations with, with these people. So a list of, of uh, personal friends, contacts, influences, all of these guys were, were, were born before uh, World War II. And uh, over the years, I've had uh, a variety of conversations with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and many of these conversations were not uh, scientific conversations, but sort of conversations over meals or drinks. Uh, and so I, I think that, I hope at least that, that some of these uh, comments that I'll make will be interesting to, uh, to, to people here. So here's a, here's a list of, of some of the personal uh, contacts of, of mine, probably names that some of you have have heard of. Uh, not You may not have heard of all of them, but I think those of you who've been around statistics for a long time have probably, uh, are probably familiar with, with most of them. Uh, my personal PhD advisor at, at, at Harvard was uh, Bill Cochran, William G. Cochran. <clears throat> and I, the parens after somebody's name mean that the, the people in parens are people I have not met but I've heard a, a lot of stories about them from the person who's listed there. So uh, Bill Cochran really never got a PhD. He got, got a, a, a master's and his, but he, he worked closely with, with Fisher in the, in the uh, early days. Bill was, it was a, a wonderful uh, person, very, very warm, uh, and, but, but very Scottish. And what I mean by that, he was very sort of brusque. The first time I met him, this must have been 1966 or seven, so probably 67. Uh, I remember knocking on, a, on his door and he said, come in. And as soon as I walked in, he started waving his hand, go away, saying, not now, not now, I'm busy. You know, too, too busy to talk now. Uh, uh, but, you know, come, come back later. Wonderful, wonderful guy. Very, very practical. And I, I remember talking to him about a, an idea I had for uh, part of a thesis topic. It was on, on matching. It was a uh, sort of a technical uh, problem. And he said, he didn't think it was that my idea had any practical importance. And if I thought it did, he's not, he didn't say that I shouldn't work on it. But if I want to work on it, he should, I should find somebody else to advise me because it's, it's not the kind of problem he cared about. Uh, now the department at, at, at the time was a relatively young department. I think the Department of Statistics was, was only founded in 1957, I think. Uh, and it, it consisted of uh, three people. One was Bill Cochran. The other, another guy was Fred Mosteller. And at the time, at the beginning, it was Art Dempster. So Fred was a, uh, was the founding chair of the department. And in fact, I think over the years he was at Harvard, he was the chair of, uh, of a few different departments. In fact, he was, at the time the Department of Statistics was, was found that he had been chair of a department called Social Relations, which is Harvard's version of psychology. <clears throat> and Fred was a great writer and a, and a great expositor. And, uh, one one thing that I remember learning from from Fred is that if you want people to if you wrote it presumably you're not writing for yourself you're writing to to be read and it's very important to write clearly and well and good writing he would emphasize is a matter of writing and rewriting you have to throw away the the first draft start again keep editing keep going on. <clears throat> The other uh, member of the department at the time was Art Dempster. When I first met Art, he was a, uh, I think a tenured associate professor, or I don't remember whether at the time, associate professor was non, I think it was non-tenured at the time. <clears throat> and and the, one of the, th Art was a very deep thinker. And the, uh, in, one of the important things I learned from Art is the importance of thinking Bayesianly. 
If you want to solve a problem and understand what's really going on, think about it from a Bayesian perspective. Even if you don't end up trying to solve the problem from that perspective, it's the, it's the most principled way to address a problem. <clears throat> Another guy that was very influential to me was, was John Tukey. Uh, and John, I, f I first met when I was an undergraduate at Princeton. And then later in, in my career, I, I spent almost a decade at Educational Testing Service in, in Princeton. And at the same time, I, I taught a course at, at Princeton University uh, as a visiting faculty member. And John was, was the, sort of the founder of the Princeton department. And he was an unusual guy, but obviously a, a genius <clears throat> in, the, in the sense of, of somebody who didn't think about problems in the, in the usual way. He was um, at, uh, in, in the department at the same time well, he was around the department, around the math department at, at this, at this uh, same time uh, John von Neumann was, was, was there. And they used to have, I, I, I heard this, I, I never uh, heard this directly from, from Tukey, but they used to have a contest <clears throat> doing a six digit long division in their head, mentally, in their heads together. And one of the stories that I, that I heard is, is Tukey could do something that von Neumann could never figure out how he could do, which is he could be given two six digit long division problems at the same time, and he could work on them at the same time simultaneously. In some crazy sense, he could separate, I guess, his two hemispheres and have each hemisphere work on one problem. Uh, very unusual guy. Uh, then one of the other guys that I, that I met, I think is very, is very influential, not in his personal way, but uh, intellectually was Jersey Neyman. I, uh, I, when I was at ETS, I had a sabbatical one, one year when I had a, when I had a Guggenheim and I visited Berkeley at the time <clears throat> and Neyman had retired and at the time the retired faculty and the visiting faculty had offices on the same top floor of um, the statistics department building and uh, so we used to uh, have coffee together, and once in a while we'd go out to lunch together. Very unusual guy, uh, e extremely organized, and he's a, uh, he, he was the the, the co-founder with with Pearson of Neyman Pearson theory of statistics, which is for many years was the dominant theory in in stat departments, and he was really the uh, uh, the founder of the of first the uh, Berkeley Statistics Laboratory, and then later the Berkeley Department, which became uh, the most dominant department in in the United States for its intellectual quality. At the time I visited Berkeley, I also uh, visited Elizabeth Scott. Very classical statistics in the in the Neyman sense, and uh, uh, Scott, Elizabeth Scott, and, and Neyman were were very very uh, close. Uh, Neyman was a uh, very much the uh, European uh, gentleman. He was, he was uh, Polish, and I, I found him to be a very charming, charming guy. Uh, another guy I, I met during a, uh, a sabbatical year was George Box. Extremely wise, practical, uh, great character, <clears throat> uh, and a uh, sort of a ribald uh, sense of humor. Uh, he loved to tell tell jokes, and he, and because he was uh, uh, British, uh, I guess he grew up in an era when uh, the, the uh, non upper class British loved making uh, telling jokes about uh, the British upper class, and also learning their accents, and so he he could tell wonderful, uh, dirty jokes with uh, about about the British upper class. Also, at the time when I when, when I knew George, when I was visiting Wisconsin, <clears throat> I had dinner a couple times at his at his house, and at the time he was he was uh, married to Joan Fisher Box, who was uh, one of Fisher's uh, daughters, uh, who was a uh, charming lady, uh, and had had Fisher's eyes. She had inherited his eyes, which meant she she was was legally blind, she said, 
very, very thick glasses and couldn't, couldn't see, see much at all. Uh, <clears throat> another guy who was influential and, and was, I think, influential in, in forming uh, statistics departments. I mean, George Box was influential in forming statistics departments because George basically uh, started the, the University of Wisconsin statistics department. Uh, and, uh, and, and at one time, which was the, one of the probably the one time was the leading statistics department in the United States, along with Berkeley. Um, another guy who's very Im Im important uh, in establishing departments was, was Paul Meyer of uh, Kaplan Meyer Statistic. He was a colleague of mine when I was at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> and Paul was a very practical guy and very influential in, the, uh, in generating interest in, in statistics in, in medicine and in law. So he was very uh, influential in getting the Food and Drug Administration in the, in the US to use randomized trials in the, in the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> Another character at the University of Chicago, Chicago when I was a, a, a colleague was a guy named Pat Billingsley. Pat was not really a statistician. I mean, he's much more of a probabilist. But one, one aspect of, of, of his that was sort of in, intriguing is he was a uh, very good-looking guy. And he, his, uh, he had a, not, he was a hobby, but also he, he did, was a professional actor. And, and in fact, uh, he, he would tell stories. Like there was one movie where he played a bit part with Jane Fonda. He, he was a, 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 a great char character. Another influential person, certainly at, at, at Harvard and, and with Fred Mosteller, was a woman named Janet Nor Norwood. Uh, Janet, over for, for many uh, appointments, she was commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I think her first appointment was under Carter, but then also the, the appointment continued under Reagan and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Bush also, Bush one also appointed here in various uh, federal positions. A very, very wise uh, woman. In fact, I think uh, she was on several Harvard visiting committees. I think got an honorary degree from, honorary PhD from Harvard. Another guy who, who I, uh, I met when I was visiting Berkeley, a guy named Eric Lehman. <clears throat> He's a Swiss gentleman. I think he was actually born in Alsace. And, uh, French part of Alsace, but uh, when he was a kid, moved to uh, Switzerland. Um, very mathematical guy. And one, one story about but Eric, you know, when he was chairman of, uh, of the Berkeley Stat Department, when I, when I visited there, uh, one of the uh, first questions I, I, I asked him <clears throat> was, uh, I, I understood that you can get a PhD in statistics at Berkeley without ever having seen a piece of data. And he looked at me with a scowl and said, my God, I certainly hope so. I mean, the, the department was, was that uh, distant, I guess, from uh, doing real data analysis uh, as, as, a, as a focus of, of the department. This is despite uh, Naaman's uh, influence. Charming guy, though, also. Another guy I met on the West Coast at the time was Charles Stein, very deep and un unusual guy. Uh, and uh, something that I, I found interesting, these are from, from, from stories that I was told, which I think is, is, is partially true, probably mostly true, is that Charles Stein at the time, at the early, early days in the, in the 50s, was at Berkeley. And then because Berkeley was a state university during the McCarthy era when people were, you know, had this, the U.S. was going through this, the U.S. government was going through this fear of communism. They had an oath signing at, at, uh, at Berkeley. And because Stein was, was quite left wing, uh, he decided he couldn't stand, the, he, he couldn't sign the oath. And at the, at the time, uh, Stanford Department was just starting out. So in, in some sense, Joe McCarthy, this Wisconsin senator who uh, started this uh, communist scare, was, the, uh, was one of the causes of the formation of the Stanford Stat Department and 
formed this bond between Stanford and, and Berkeley staff departments where the pair of them for many years and maybe to, to some extent continue to this day to be the uh, strongest center of statistics in the, in the United States. Another guy who was uh, influential, this was at the University of Chicago, was a, a guy named David Ross. Really, really nice, nice guy. Uh, the the, the co-author with Fred Mosteller of uh, the Federalist Papers. Uh, super knowledgeable. He got his PhD under Tukey, and he, he knew almost everything, it seemed like. And he referred to all these papers that Tukey had written, but had never published. But he had, you know, but he, he could pull out a copy of it. Uh, David was also inter interesting because he would tell uh, stories about John Nash, the uh, uh, mathematician, the economist, who um, was very, very uh, famous, you know, the, a beautiful mind, you know, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and David was a, uh, office mate of Nash's at MIT uh, when, after, where they both had postdocs. Um, so David would tell stories about Nash. Not very nice. I mean, David was a very nice guy, but the stories he would tell about Nash was were how, what a difficult uh, office mate he and Nash was. Of course, Nash also was schizophrenic, which probably didn't help very much. Another guy who was uh, very influential was, was John Pratt. Uh, who was a part of the uh, uh, stat department for many years at Harvard. Very, very sharp guy, very, very knowledgeable. Uh, uh, got his PhD at, uh, at Stanford. An interesting story is, is, is that Pratt is a very old and distinguished name. <clears throat> and apparently one of his great, great grandfathers, or great, I don't know how many greats there are there, was a, uh, in the U.S. Civil War, was a, uh, a general, <clears throat> and in fact, his family lived in what's now Weston for uh, for uh, generations. And apparently, uh, uh, Grant, who was the Civil War general, gave uh, uh, some land in in Weston to the Pratt family, which which they held for many years. Uh, another extremely sharp guy uh, who's still alive is Herman Chernoff at 96, uh, a member of our department since, I guess I was the, the chairman when we hired him, Herman Chernoff. Herman is very, is very quiet in, in some ways, but he has tremendous understanding of many problems, which is not known to, uh, I think, many students, because he, he, uh, uh, they, they, he's, he, he's very uh, unassuming. <clears throat> yeah, but if you get in, into conversations, even about uh, applied statistics, it's a real pleasure because Herman has great understanding. Uh, another influence on me, a guy I've, I've known since uh, 1976 mm -hmm. when I uh, uh, visited uh, England, is David Cox. Extremely modest guy, but, but uh, incredibly broad with remarkable depth and, and modesty about his his knowledge regarding him as a uh, as, as a great old friend and another guy who is uh, has made vast contributions to uh, statistics is C.R. Rao uh, who's uh, still going strong at uh, I think he's going to be 100 years old uh, in September he's uh, one of the one of, one of the few Fisher PhD students but he's a uh, wonderful person and, and very influential. And, and also he was very in, influential at, at ISI, which is not as, uh, but Indian Statistics uh, Institute. Uh, and so uh, all, these, all these guys, I think, have been very uh, influential in, uh, in, in sustaining uh, statistics departments in the United States and, and elsewhere. Now, my, my view of, of the reason for separate statistics departments is uh, idiosyncratic, and it's partially because my pathway, my transition into the field of statistics uh, is also rather idiosyncratic. 
I started out in my college years in Princeton physics department, uh, where my uh, sort of mentor at the time was a guy named John Wheeler. I've talked about Wheeler uh, before, but, but uh, Wheeler was a very important uh, physicist. Uh, and he was a, uh, a colleague of Einstein's, uh, von, von Neumann, uh, an incredibly good teacher. And uh, I don't have time to go into the, the reasons why I think he was, he was such, such, such a great, great teacher. But one of the reasons was, was that he was uh, extremely modest. Uh, not only was, was he a colleague of, of, of Einstein's, but in their, their photographs of him walking with, with Einstein in, on the Princeton campus. But also one of his PhD students was Richard Feynman. So if, you, if, if, you, if your colleagues are Einstein and you have, have a, as a PhD student, uh, Feynman, I, it's kind of difficult to be arrogant, uh, which a lot of faculty at Ivy League colleges are, but, but Wheeler never was. Um, I probably would have stayed in physics if he had, if he had stayed at, 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 at Princeton, actually. But, but in 62, I think it was, he went to University of Texas at, at, at Austin before returning to Princeton later. Uh, so we, I, but when I was uh, at, at Princeton, uh, actually in the, my second year there, I uh, switched to uh, psychology. Uh, and that, that was, was a long story why, but it, it had partially to do with the Vietnam War and the uh, awkwardness of being a uh, male student at the time facing a, a draft and, and, and how to uh, stay out of the draft while, while still being in, in, in school and, and going to uh, a graduate school. So I switched to psychology and, and there I was very influenced by a guy named Sylvan Tompkins. Uh, who had a, these books called Affect, Imagery, and Consciousness. And he had this wonderful theory about how emotions are uh, feedback from the reactions, involuntary reactions that your face has. And so there's a long story about, uh, about, about that. Anyway, so I stayed in, in psychology. It allowed me to, to stay in Princeton a, a year longer than I would have otherwise if I'd stayed in physics. Uh, and so I, when I applied to graduate school, I, I applied in psychology. Well, it's not psych it was in the field of psychology, but the department was called uh, social uh, relations. And I was in that for about uh, a month in, uh, at Harvard 1965. But when I realized this really isn't for me, is I, there were people who really devoted to this field of psychology, but that is very social psychology and more sociology. In, in, in many ways than in psychology. And so I, uh, I looked around for another department uh, to switch to, because I had my own, my own funding from NSF, and I went to computer science. And uh, there I started learning about automata and computational complexity and some of the things uh, that, that were uh, big in, in, in computer science. Um, I didn't last there long either. Um, and, and, in, uh, and I switched to statistics, I think it was in 1968, <clears throat> and I uh, started working with uh, uh, Cochran and then the, and the other guys in, in, in statistics, Mosteller and Dempster. Uh, and then I got a PhD in statistics in 1970, Stayed on as a uh, lecturer uh, in 1971, and then moved on to Educational Testing Service back to Princeton, where I was for almost a decade. <clears throat> and there I, I, I also taught in the, uh, the new statistics department, which was headed by, by uh, John, John Tukey. Uh, and I became more friends with John Tukey, partially because Tukey did, did work at educational testing service and test theory and things like that. And I also at the time became uh, good friends with psychologists who I'd met when I was a student at, at Princeton named Julian James, who's uh, influential on me for a different reason. 
he had written, he was the time he was writing uh, th this book that was published in the 1970s called um, the, um, Origin, the uh, Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. So he had this theory about how we thought, and it basically said bicameral mind to two hemispheres. Two hemispheres are only connected at the, at the base of the, of the brain by a ganglia of nerves called the corpus callosum. And uh, in uh, the early uh, existence of human thought, <clears throat> humans communicated th with the, between the two hemispheres by zapping messages back and forth between the two hemispheres as language. <clears throat> and the two hemispheres would, would speak to each other by hearing voices. And we heard these, these voices as voices of gods. And then uh, in time, there's a theory that Julian had uh, that, the, that we uh, humans eventually realized that these were internal conversation and, and not voices of gods. And he wrote this, this wonderfully interesting book called The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And I, I found that these psychologists, although they didn't think mathematically, most of them, they were still, uh, very uh, influential. Something I will add here also, so it's not on, on the slides, <clears throat> but when I was applying to uh, uh, graduate schools, I was applying in, in psychology, and uh, one, one of the guys that, that I, I met uh, was uh, Amos Tversky. And, uh, and, and Amos was, uh, was the guy who wrote these uh, uh, these books with uh, Tversky and Kahneman, or Kahneman and, and Tversky. And Kahneman eventually got a Nobel Prize for the for the for the, for the work. And it was a lot of one of the things you learned is that people mis misjudge uh, probabilities and odds all the time. Um, so at another time, I when I had a. a sabbatical. Uh, I, I visited the University of Wisconsin in 1980 at the Math Research Center and became very friendly with, with uh, George, George Box, a wonderful guy. Uh, and the Math Research Center had moved uh, away from its building in the uh, 1970s where there was a, uh, it was bombed by some graduate students, uh, some left-wing graduate students. Uh, in the middle of the night, they didn't want to hurt anybody. Uh, then I uh, first <clears throat> academic position was at the University of Chicago. I was for a, a few years where I became friendly with David Wallace um, and Paul Meyer and Steve Stigler. Steve Stigler was a great, great guy, great uh, sense, of, sense of humor uh, and great sense of history. So if you want a, a, an accurate lecture on the history of statistics, you should be uh, hearing that from, from, from Steve, not, not from me. So uh, in, in 1983, I moved to Harvard Statistics and was in the statistics department until I retired in, in 2018. And then since that time, I've been at the uh, Yao Mathematical, Mathematical Sciences Center at Chinua University. Uh, and also I have a, a, I'm a, I'm a, a fellow at Fox, uh, business school in, in Philadelphia. And who, who knows when I'll retire from those. So that's an idiosyncratic tr transition in the field of statistics. And therefore, that's why it, it leads to an idiosyncratic view of, of the past in, in, in the uh, transition of in, uh, why statistics departments were formed. So it's not, this, the rest of this talk is not purported to be historically entirely accurate because it's influenced by these people who influenced me. And what I gleaned was important for, for helping to found these, these uh, statistics departments. One thing that I think is uh, interesting is when you, when you realize that the use of models, you know, uh, stochastic models uh, in, uh, go back for hundreds of years. But the thing that was different about statistics departments, at least early on, was there were two modes of, of thinking about probability, uh, the use of probability, and it was then statistics, primarily experimental design and survey methods. And sometimes they're called randomization-based 
sometimes they're called design-based methods in survey methods. This was, uh, in surveys, it was, it was really stimulated by Naaman in a very influential 1934 paper, uh, which actually defined things like confidence intervals. Uh, and the same randomization-based ideas were used in experimental design, and these were generated by, by Fisher, which is the geometry of analysis of variance. Uh, the idea of that, that everything came from symmetry arguments based on really a, a deep understanding of Euclidean geometry. Um, uh, and, and the statistics departments, I think, were distinct in their intellectual content because they, they these two important subfields both use this different kind of prob, prob, different kind of probability to generate inferences. Because the probabilities were not based on uh, models of the data, how nature generated data. They were being used in, in genetics and astronomy too, to worry about errors of measurement. But the, the probabilities came from something the designer did. The person who designed the study, either designed the survey or, or, or designed the experiment. The actual, the, the, they described it as a physical act of randomization. And so, in fact, one of the major books that was around the statistics department at the time, which we were, as a student, trained to use, was the RAND table of random numbers. So it was a big, fat book of nothing but random numbers that were physically generated by processes that were considered to be uh, random. And so the, but the, the distinct methods of, of, of inference that were part of statistics departments were this, where the probabilities were generated by physical active randomization, and these were probabilities on the indicator variables for whether you were in, in or out of the survey or indicator variables for which treatment you got randomly assigned. Uh, and of course, this was, was coupled with the uh, importance in the United States of uh, land-grant colleges. The Department of Agriculture had established all these universities that were state universities, uh, like University of Illinois, University of Indiana, University of Wisconsin, University of Pennsylvania, which were always were, were, were founded as land-grant colleges and universities because the importance of agriculture. Uh, and so they, all, they always had statistics departments for doing these uh, experiments, not only experiments on, in the agriculture and animal husbandry, but also experiments on land, uh, censuses, because they, were, they had a responsibility for the uh, federal government. Chemistry was also uh, a very important application of uh, statistics. And this was especially important in World War II, as probably many of you have, have read in other, other places. Uh, uh, chemistry is what got, for example, George, George Box into uh, statistics, because he was in the, in the army in, uh, in, in World War, in the English army, in, uh, British army in, in World War II, and he had to design an experiment because of poison gas. Being, being, being used, uh, or the fear of poison gas and other kind of weapons. And he, he uh, needed to, uh, was told to visit George Box. Uh, not, not George Box had to visit Fisher to, to understand more about experimental design. And the story that, that, that Box tells in order to get him to visit, he had to deliver a horse to, uh, to a, uh, uh, Rothamsted in order to, to visit, visit Fisher. And in fact, as many of you probably know, uh, Box uh, and uh, Tukey uh, both got PhDs in chemistry, uh, not in mathematics or, or physics. So one thing to notice with this, with this, this past is notice the focus on randomization-based inference, which we replaced in these uh, uh, early stat departments uh, the, the use of, of standard models on data. Of course, there were still standard models being taught and probability being taught, but these distinct um, design of experiments and, and design of surveys 
I think was the real reason why there were separate departments of statistics, I mean, separate from, from, from math departments and, and, dis, and distinct from uh, it's now become data science departments or uh, machine learning departments. And I still think that there's, a, there's an, an important role to play. So they, this, this new religion of, of statistics said these indicators are the only random quantities in the early departments. Of course, this, uh, this is sort of, I, in many departments has, has disappeared. And even at, at, at Harvard, uh, the, the current course we have in um, experimental de design is, is rel was taught on and off o over the years, but is uh, the course being taught uh, this semester is, is relatively new. Uh, and, and we, I don't think Harvard Statistics has had a, a real course in survey design in, in, in years. It's sort of given it away to uh, sociology departments or sometimes psychology departments. Uh, but the usual models, uh, being the models on, on the data, go back hundreds of years, used in gambling, astronomy, genetics, all, all over the place. But this, this new, new, meaning the, the new as of the 20s and 30s, uh, 40s, religion was different and had its own de definitions of validity. And validity then became so the, the basis for valid statistical inference. And what it meant was approximately unbiased estimation of estimates, of, of parameters to be estimated, <clears throat> and conservative interval estimation and hypothesis tests. And that comes from uh, uh, Neyman's definition of, of confidence intervals in, in, in 1934. You know, a 95% conf confidence interval is one that includes its estimate in at least 95% uh, of, the, of, of the time or repeated samples. But because of limited computing, the, these early methods of, of inference always had approximations <clears throat> that relied on asymptotics, normal approximations. Uh, and I think the, the formation of the separate departments was it relied not only on the agriculture and uh, world and genetics and the restrictions of World War II and their focus on chemistry, but the personality of Neyman was no doubt critical for uh, for, 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 for forming uh, uh, the Berkeley and thereby because of uh, uh, communism, uh, Berkeley Stanford strength. Uh, personality, but also the success of Edward Deming uh, in consulting Box and consulting Box uh, with the Box Jenkin time series methods, uh, and Tukey Mosteller in consulting and teaching. Mosteller especially in in, in teaching, in, because you know Mosteller in the in the fifties uh, taught co continental classroom on TV, so it reached vast vast audiences, and uh, and both Box and Tukey were big in consulting in the military uh, and, and, uh, and, and the, you know, the, after World War II and, uh, and the fear of communism and the Cold War, uh, Box and Tukey were very active uh, consulting for them. <clears throat> and then, of course, in the 50s, uh, the, the idea of randomized experiments made its way into medicine. Uh, originally with the experiments in the UK uh, on uh, uh, antibiotics in the late 50s. And then they became part of FDA, Food and Drug Administration in the United States and the European Medicines Association. And Paul Meyer was very in influential in getting uh, FDA to use actual randomized experiments for the approval of drugs um, rather than just having committees of doctors and, uh, and pharmacists uh, give testimony. So it became part of separate statistics departments. But what about the future? I mean, are, are, are we going to continue to have separate statistics departments? Well, is there any need for these statistical ideas? And I'm going to have more to, to be positive to say about these statistical ideas. It's, that's what the yes refers to. These statistical ideas are very important to really need separate statistics departments to teach these big ideas? Well, I'm not sure, but these ideas really are critical. Experimental de design now, is, I think even more critical than it ever was because of this era of big data. Big data means many factors, many, uh, uh, rand many factors 
that you can randomize simultaneously at the, at the big time, multifactorial experiments. Many covariates, you know, half a million in, in some cases. And, the, and the, these are basic covariates. Then you look at the interactions be, between them. Uh, there are you know, vast numbers of, of, of co, co, covariates that, that you want to balance. And in physical experiments, it, the, the limitations are, are not the ones I'm computing any, anymore, but the physical limitations. And because you, you can't have uh, trays for, for doing uh, chemical experiments with uh, uh, a half a million you know, wells to put in different chemicals. Um, and even if you're talking about computer-based experiments, my experience from reading some of these articles is they're currently dreadfully designed in general because the people who designed these computer-based experiments in, uh, from, uh, typically do not have any training in experimental design. They often, because the success of data science departments or computer science departments uh, at, at MIT and, and other, other uh, uh, computer-oriented uh, computer places or uh, engineering places, uh, they're designed by, by these experiments aren't designed by people who, who understand experimental design. Because uh, I think experimental design has become uh, more part of engineering and, and, and less part of, quote, science. Um, and in, in survey design, for example, I think we have very uh, limited courses in statistics departments on survey design. This is despite the network structure of, of units, which makes survey design far more complex now than it used to be. And one of the uh, projects I'm involved in uh, is, is one at, at Lincoln Labs out in Lexington, uh, Massachusetts. It's a project on uh, Russian election interference that I'm doing with, with a former PhD student at, at Harvard who's worked at Lincoln Labs for many years and, and, and uh, uh, is Ed Cowell. And it's a, it's a, pro it's a project demonstrating that uh, what it's trying to do experimental design on, on the internet where the different uh, nodes, uh, units are, are, are different uh, internet sites where the, the limitations again are the ability to actually interview or, or pursue each of these sites to find out which, which ones are Russian influence. And, and the, the work uh, successfully indicated that there are uh, um, many of, the, of these influential sites, influential in the sense of uh, generating uh, tweets and retweets are, are Russian influence. <clears throat> so is the current definition of statistical validity, which really is based on Neyman from his 1923 initial paper, uh, Neyman Pearson theory adequate for science. I think the current definition of, of uh, Neyman Pearson validity is, is not adequate. I think it's too focused on estimators and standard errors. You mean you give an estimate plus or, or, or minus a, a standard error. It's obviously it's all based on asymptotics, uh, meaning that, that asymptotic, all these estimators are normally distributed. So all you need to know is there is the estimate plus or minus a, a standard error. Uh, and sometimes they think uh, these departments, as, uh, and I have some literature that I could I could quote now, starts without but starts with the estimates without even clearly defined estimands. And I guess this goes back to my physics days uh, and uh, an influence of of Wheeler. You have to know what you're trying to estimate. You have to understand the science before you start talking about estimate estimators. And um, uh, that's something that I still find frustrating with uh, about some of the work that uh, some of my colleagues in, in economics do. They seem to start with estimators and then derive the asymptotic distribution of the estimators showing it's consistent for something without even starting worrying about what you're trying to estimate. And even if Neyman Pearson asymptotics were okay, uh, it doesn't generalize very well because there are asymmetries, especially with, with multidimensional uh, estimates, 
they're, they're, uh, and you get non-ellipsoidal regions for tests where the, where the usual asymptotics give you answers that are wrong by orders of magnitude. And there, there are a couple recent, there's a paper I wrote in 1983 uh, about why you can't trust these uh, usual uh, normal asymptotics, normal based asymptotics. And there's more recent work they've done with it, with, an, uh, with some colleagues in, in Italy, primarily uh, Fabrizio Vialli. And even when Naaman Pearson is, is, is okay, and even when these asymptotics work, uh, I think that uh, this current definition of, of uh, validity should be extended to conditional calibration. Conditional calibration really tries to embody uh, Fisher's fundamental idea of fiducial inference which I think is a really important idea, which is never really got the, the, the full acceptance that it that should have. I think partially because the people who've tried to make it work, like uh, Dempster and the dempster Schaefer material and even Tron Hailu, they, they focus, I think, on, on the mathematics, which is intriguing, but is not really what's important. The basic idea, I think, of fiducial inference is you should avoid accepting models that cannot plausibly generate the observed data. And that seems to me so fundamental that it really doesn't need much of a justification, except uh, that's what we tend to do with, with uh, uh, Naaman Pearson asymptotics. But that's a, that's a topic for another talk, so I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go, go in, uh, into that in any detail. I think also an, another thing about statistics ideas that the appreciation for visual displays and the role of classical tools, the visual displays and this understanding of Euclidean geometry, that's what the analysis of variance is, is really about. And it's not the way it's, it's, it's taught now. It's taught too much, uh, here's how you calculate this, how you decompose some of the squares, but that's certainly not how, how Fisher uh, thought about it, nor how, how, how Tukey thought about it. I remember having a lunch with, with Tukey probably out of from the 70s or 80s. And he was a really unusual guy. I remember one of these times he said, you know, most people cannot think beyond two dimensions. And he, he said, I can get to about 2.3. Uh, it's in a private conversation at lunch. And we were discussing, the, just, just the two of us, we are discussing, uh, we had a conversation about an ETS test question, which I think at the time made it into the New York Times because uh, it was a test question that turns out, the, when ETS was developing tests, they had all these you know, high-powered mathematicians like, like Tukey see whether they, they were getting, whether, they, whether they, it was a multiple choice question, whether, they, whether the alternative choices were, were reasonable, and whether ETS got the right answers. And this was a question that uh, turns out all these math guys blew. I think, I think John said he, he, could, he could, he, after he found out that, that he, the answer was wrong, that he got it right. And uh, I don't remember the exact question, but you had through two three-dimensional pyramids and they had, for their bases, the, both bases were, 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 the, were, the, were the same, uh, but the, the sides were different. I think it's because of an asymmetry in, in them or something like that. And the question, if you put these two pyramids together, because they, they, they weren't right, right uh, angle uh, pyramids, but the question was, if you put these two bases together, how many sides did the resulting figure have? And what the answer was supposed to be, they thought, was you added up the, up the number of sides from the two uh, pyramids, and then you subtracted two for the, for the uh, coincident faces. But it turned out that somebody objected to, to the, the answer when his answer was, was marked wrong, because he said uh, he actually wiped out another face. There were three that were wiped out, because two of the, of the other faces turned out to be coplanar. And how, and that's, it, it's, an, it's a wonderful example, because it shows how limited we are in thinking about three three dimensions because all these math full professors from all the great universities got the wrong answer and this one kid wrote in to say that they were all wrong and he was right so i think there's it just shows how difficult it is to to get to get to 
high, high, high dimensions. And this part of the idea of this is that the <clears throat> analysis of variance is not just F tests. What it's telling you are which of the tables should be reported. In which of the interactions, which, what is the dimension of the tables that you, that you need to report, to display on, on a page of paper that will, will uh, reproduce all, that can re, u, be used to reproduce all, all the re, results, and what are the importance of the detail that got lost in that, re, that reporting. So this, this actually was, was, was wisdom that I got from Cochrane that, that he attributed to uh, Fisher. It's a recondite wisdom, but I think it's the kind of thing that, that Fisher understood and isn't, isn't taught very much. Now, do we, do we want to um, uh, do that kind of teaching? I, th I think, we, I think we, we do. Do we need staff departments? I'm not sure. But the current, it's a personal criticism of the, the way uh, current uh, applied statistics is, is taught. It's taught too much of a dance of the bees. You, know, you follow plug-in recipe and you do this and that, you manipulate this and that, and then uh, you do it with little or no understanding of the science uh, or the underlying mathematical justification. And I think we should, we should uh, focus much more on the understanding. Uh, and I, I doubt having separate statistics departments can cure this problem the way statistics is, is being taught. I think, uh, especially if, it may, if administration, if university administration deans evaluate departments by their popularity in terms of enrollments rather than the, than the quality of, of instruction. And, I, and, and that probably is a, is, is a, is a criticism that, de that should depend upon the, the role of, of particular universities. Um, and it's probably a, more of a criticism of departments at universities like Harvard and, uh, and quality Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, uh, and I think that's probably why Berkeley and Stanford have somehow drifted away from, from this traditional way of, way of teaching uh, that, because they, they want to maintain quality, even if Berkeley and Stanford are more in machine learning than in this traditional uh, statistics. And I think that it's, it's tempting for uh, stat departments to become service departments for other departments pursuing real academics. Because if that's all we have to offer is teaching the dance of the bees, it may be important at, at some universities where you have hundreds and hundreds or thousands of students having to learn basic statistics because that's what we're training them for to become, uh, go, go become a, a statisticians in the pharmaceutical in industry or for agriculture uh, departments. Uh, but there's, if that happens, then, then uh, these fundamental ideas of, of statistics disappear. I think we need uh, strong leaders uh, in, in statistics like NAMI uh, uh, with a focus on who understand the ideas of science and with a devotion to important statistical I ideas. And, and one thing that's, uh, that I think is interesting is that's why uh, Joan Fisher Box's book, Fisher, Life of a Scientist, I think that's in incredibly important. Okay, that's it. So I'll, I'll be happy to uh, go to questions now. And let's see, so how do I do that, Ryan? I go up here to something. Uh, so uh, people can uh, ask questions using the chat function. There's a, they should be able to see a Q&A option okay, so on the bottom of their screen. Do, do, they so can also... Do I, do I have to change something here? Nope, you should be able to see a uh, red dot next to the Q&A if someone asks a question. Okay, so, so I do I just, uh, should I uh, stop share or not? Uh, it's up to you, it doesn't matter. You can stop doesn't share, matter. that may make it easier to view your screen. Okay. The attendees okay, can also your screen. Don, maybe I ask a question? Sure, Yao. Yes. How, how do you make that teachers and students to learn other science? That's a very good question. Um, well, in fact, it has something to do with my attitude uh, towards the students we admitted at, at Harvard for, for the PhD program. Uh, 
both I, I think, and Art and, and Herman Chernoff, or Dempster and Herman Chernoff, early on preferred having admitting students to the statistics PhD program who did not get undergraduate degrees in statistics, but got undergraduate degrees in something else. And uh, mm. I, th I think that, that, that something else could be almost any science, or they could be mathematics. Mm. Uh, but, but, but we all felt that there wasn't enough content in statistics, the field of statistics to have somebody do it uh, for two or three years as an undergraduate and then do it for five years as a graduate student. Uh, and I, uh, so, so we really, uh, I mean, I, in particular, I, I love to see PhD students uh, apply from physics, for example. Uh, and one, 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 one example of that was uh, one, one of my really great graduate students, Andrew Gelman, who applied from MIT. And he was, he was a physics undergraduate, a, physics, a joint physics and, and math undergraduate. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, uh, uh, and even, even uh, I think, Zhao Li Meng, uh, who, who applied from, uh, where was he again? Shutan. Uh, Shutan, right. Yeah, I, I think he, he had uh, an, an economics co-major. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it's, uh, it, it's I, I think P, a, a PhD in statistics is a great degree, but, I'm, but back then we were never really uh, that, uh, the, we meaning Herman and Art and I, we were never that convinced there was a great undergraduate degree. And so now to have a uh, statistics department very proud of its undergraduate degree, because that makes the deans I've, I've evidently very happy, and therefore they give us you know, more uh, uh, senior appointments or more general, general appointments. Is that, is that good for science? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> It's a good question of, of do, do, do you start students, uh, if they're in a PhD program, uh, try to encourage them to be interested in, a, in another field. Actually, we, we, we when, again, going back to the old days of, of Harvard's uh, statistics, we used to uh, force them, not force them, encourage them to have a, they had to have a cognate, but then the, if the cognate became something like, uh, became computer science, became sort of too, too close to uh, uh, statistics. I think we wanted them to have it in a real science, but that sort of was hard to maintain. Good question. <laughs> Without a good answer. No, that's a good answer. So is there anything else I, sh I should click on here to in encourage other questions? Actually, I, I just noticed the time. I guess I, I talked longer than I, than I thought. It's, it's a really, no, 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 uh, it's okay. I think it's not. How okay. about the future of statistics? Will, will it be lead more by application or by theory? Another good question. Uh, my, own, my own feeling is it's, it's going to be led by, um, by, by both. I think, for example, it, it's going to, uh, in, in the future, it's going to have to become more uh, aware of the uh, influence that enhanced computing has on, on the field of statistics. Traditionally, everything was asymptotics because you couldn't compute anything. <clears throat> but, but, but now, for example, one of the, I've had a series of, of papers that, that led to a, uh, a course at, at uh, Chin Chin Hua that was, was co-taught uh, with Kara Ding in the uh, 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 statistics group on re-randomization. The idea of re-randomization, very intuitive. Uh, if you want to get a design that has good balance, meaning if you have a treatment group and a control group, you want the distribution of background variables to be about the same in treatment and control groups. Now we can do, and traditionally you did that in traditional statistics, 
by complete randomization, just relying on the expectation to work out, or you relied on blocking, intentionally creating uh, designs where you forced a balance either in distribution in, in, in agricultural plots, like using physical Latin squares, or in design by forcing that kind of balance. But in some sense, with modern computing, what you can do, and this started with, with a paper with my former PhD student, Carrie Locke Morgan, is you can look at hundreds of thousands of randomizations and throw out the ones that don't have requisite balance. And requisite balance could be things like the difference in multivariate means between treatment and control groups using classical measures like Mahalanobis distance. But to even think of doing like 100,000 randomizations and, and only picking the 1% best in terms of their Mahalanobis distance, in the old days, it, it took you know, an hour to do a good randomization with, with, with many units because you had to go to a, a book of random numbers and open to a page and put your finger down somewhere. But now with, with computers, you can do this very easily, although you still get, get, get in, in, into situations when doing uh, randomization tests, Fisher, Fisherian randomization permutation tests, where, it be, where that becomes incredibly expensive uh, computationally, but not necessarily in the, in the future. And I think that these kind of ideas of re-randomization are very, very powerful. And in fact, right now, there's an exchange of, of, of papers that are, going to, that are going to appear in Biometrica uh, that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm having with, a, uh, uh, with some co-authors from uh, Chinua University and uh, with, a, with a guy who got his PhD, uh, Nathan Callis, from MIT uh, in computer science or AI uh, on, on, on re-randomization versus re-randomization where you randomly draw from a restricted subset rather than tr try to choose the optimal de design based on minimax ideas. Uh, so I, I think the, this whole uh, computational take and this interaction with machine learning guys and to, and to, 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 do, to do better designs uh, will, will really opens up a, a whole new region of, uh, of uh, theory as well as, that, as uh, applications. Uh, in fact, there's a guy whose name I don't remember at Chin Chinhua who has some interesting results that are, are based on ideas of, uh, again, geometrical ideas and geometrical understanding of, of, uh, uh, of uh, Euclidean ge geometry and regions that uh, demonstrate that that's some of these current ideas from social science, but how you do match sampling and stuff are completely ridiculous, yet they get a lot of press because they're uh, social, in social science, uh, the standards for publication aren't as great. But, but there, 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 was, there certainly is, is a new, new theory that op opens up, but I think a, a lot of it has to be sensitive to uh, the advances in computing. Good. I think there are some questions from other people. Great. Uh, now, do I know how to, how, how to do this? What do I do here? I'm, I'm, oh, I, I see I'm on chat. Is that right? So I, right. So I click chat, Ryan? Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. I now click chat. Now what do I do? I, do I see it somewhere? Uh, there should be a comment there. I also have uh, someone who'd like to speak. Someone has a question. There is. Something. Okay, great. So what, why don't you just, if you can just put the I'll person on. Talk. Yeah, I'll allow them to Go on. Yes. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Ray. <laughs> oh, hey, Ray. How are uh, you? Hi, I'm fine here. I'm at home. So I have a question about this, this topic that about the uh, separate department of statistics here. Because I think in Chihuahua University here, we have the people doing statistics in math center, math department, and also stat center. And I also know some other people doing this in uh, uh, some computer science or engineering. So I think uh, because uh, I do the applied part of uh, bioinformatics. So for me, uh, based on my experience, I think that the statistics can be focused on many, many different aspects based on their own project. And I would like to hear your um, 
suggestions on how the students should, you know, uh, choose or uh, is there any suggestions for the students to focus on their own options of these different departments before they really go to the academia part? Well, I, th I, I think that uh, bridges between these different departments uh, is far more Im important than the uh, formation of different departments. I mean, I, I guess I, I feel like I have very little, little wisdom to say in how you should sort of structure different departments. I, I care much more about the um, intellectual integrity of the uh, of the work being being done, and as, as you know, Ray, from our interactions, I I also uh, care a tremendous amount about communication be, between departments and uh, and clear writing, uh, and 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 therefore the uh, the the focus on, on on departments that are that have uh, uh, that that do battle with each other, I th I think is ridiculous. Uh, and one of the things that I that I really like about Chinhua University, and and being in in the in the Yao Math Center, is there's a um, it's sort of nice to be back in in in, in a department that, that has uh, uh, respect for, for for real quality math mathematics, but that also has has respect for interactions with other departments like. Like the stat center and and biology departments, I, mean, I I think that interactions between people with different strengths is just far more Im important than how how departments are actually structured. I think the interactions be, between uh, scholars is what drives science, and uh, and, and not the de not the individual departments. You know, actually, we are forming the a prime F center, which will be. Interdisciplinary statistic would be uh, playing an important role to interact with other disciplines. And I think that's great. I think that, yeah. that that's the way it should be, uh, be, because people have different different interests and different strengths, and and we you want uh, if everybody has the same interest, it's 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 like having a basketball team where where everybody wants to, uh, wants to be the center. Everyone wants wants to. Uh, you can't do that. You have to have have complementary uh, strengths, uh, and I think that's one of the uh, uh, problems with university. This one size fits all. Uh, some some universities have where everybody should be a wonderful teacher, or everybody should be a great scientist. No, you you want departments and groups with not only different kinds of strengths, but strengths in, in different areas, so they can. Uh, talk to each other and, and continue to learn from each other. Good. Other questions? Should I do something to try to get to other questions or? Ryan, do you know how to do it? Uh, there's right. no other uh, hands raised. Uh, no other so hands raised? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So if people have questions, just raise your hand. It's one of the options on the bottom of your screen. Oh, send who? Who? Is anybody here? Yeah. Okay. There's a Where comment do I see in it? the um, oh, that, yeah, I'll allow this person to talk. Okay. This who son who raised their hands, his hand. Yep, I just gave him talking permission, so he needs to unmute himself. Uh, I can, I see unmute. I tried to unmute. Okay. Yeah, who's that? What happens? He has to, I think he has to allow unmute on his own screen. So you can I hear do? me. Oh, yeah. there he is. So I, uh, so you said that uh, statistics, uh, the outcome is very most important. Uh, so yes. it's like uh, quantum mechanics. So the observables, so everything has to be compared with the observables, and and you also emphasize uh, some kind of connection of uh, statistics with quantum mechanics. 
So yes, I, I would have more comments from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the, this this I, this idea that, 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 that quantum mechanics has something um, uh, in common with statistics, especially causal inference in statistics, experimental design. There's this uh, idea that when you're doing an experiment, you can, for example, use either an active treatment or a controlled treatment. It could be taking a drug, taking a placebo. <clears throat> and uh, you, if you take if you took the drug, you'd see one outcome, like uh, your headache would go away. If you took the placebo, you'd see another outcome. Now both those outcomes exist, but you can't see both of them. There's only one. They both exist at at a, at a point in time, but their potential outcomes is sort of like uh, position and momentum in quantum mechanics, and uh, I think this idea is a very recent idea. It's a 20th century idea, uh, which grew up in, in you know, the Copenhagen School in quantum mechanics in the early 20th, uh, 20th century. About the same time, Fisher was talking about these things in terms of experimental design, viewing, and, and, and Neyman as well, that these two outcomes, called potential outcomes, both exist, or they, they cannot be simultaneously observed. And I've looked a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great scholar of history at all, but I've looked a little bit for uh, the existence of, of, of that fundamentally important idea before uh, the 20th century. I don't see it. I, I, I think the idea that you can have things that are both well-defined, both exist, but you have to decide which one you're going to measure precisely. Uh, is 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 a un, un, almost uniquely 20th century idea. So so that's the tie between experimental design, um, that is, it, which really is is one of the reasons for the field of statistics as as we know it, and uh, and quantum mechanics. I think that's uh, com complementary. Yeah, you know, okay, so like a complementary principle. Yeah, you can uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, there, of I course, I, I feel very very fortunate to have been exposed to to that 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 I that idea when I was very young. So when I got into, and when I was probably, I, I probably first was exposed to that idea when I was still in high school in the, in the late, in the late fifties, taking a, a, a university physics course um, from a great guy, teacher named uh, Craig Anspaugh. Uh, but, it, but it, it, so when it, when it occurred to me in, in statistics, in the context of experimental design, so you had these two potential outcomes, it just seemed natural. It, that that's 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 the world two things that that you need in order to define something but you can't see them both and that's okay because i, I was young enough when i was exposed to it but it's just part of the world good friends um are there other questions ryan do you see any people uh, it looks like we have another hand raised. Okay. Hi. Hi, it's Ray. I'm back here. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, I have another question. It's uh, that I think, uh, as we discussed this before, math is not science, but uh, as, uh, as all these subjects, such as math and uh, uh, medicine and biology and uh, maybe uh, uh, economic and all these are uh, like science. So. Uh, I will train as a, as a student in math department, so I would like to hear your uh, understanding of um, what's the main difference between the my, the math, math student's mind and the statistics student's mind, or the uh, more general, the science mind. That's an in interesting question. Um, I, oh, it, my impression is, you know, scientific minds, there, there's, there, there's a thirst for uh, 
knowledge about the real world, I think, and as a caricature, I'm not saying this is, I mean, I mean Yao is a great example of someone who, who, who doesn't fit the mold of, of what I'm gonna say for math mind. Uh, the math mind to, to me when I was a kid, the reason I, I sort of drifted into physics and, and then statistics rather than, than, than pure math is the pure math mind, at least to me, back then was uh, playing games. You know, like it's like, okay, let's play a game of chess, but let's set up the new rules where uh, if you queened a pawn, it could only become a knight or something like that. You know, you know it's, it's, or, or playing go. You know, how, do you, how do you set up the, the rules of, 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 of game playing? Uh, and that never interested me as, as much as science. Uh, we were trying to figure out the, the laws of nature. Um, so it's, in fact, I think even, even some of the early economists tried, tried to do that. Now, there, there also is a big branch of, of, of applications of statistics that's more in sort of business economics and how to make money. Uh, never interested me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Are there other questions? Okay, if not, we really fan um, Don. It's a very beautiful talk and very nice. I'd like to um, keep this uh, uh, video to other students in Chenghua. I hope Absolutely. you don't mind. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and thank you very much for the invitation and Re and uh, send you for the for the comments and also my, my thanks to Ryan for making this possible. Because otherwise without Ryan's help, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, this is new to us. Okay. Okay, this is the first lecture of all. So thank you very much. It, it was a successful experience. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Now I have to figure out how to, how to turn it off. Let me see. Stop yes, me. I can do for you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, thanks Ryan very much. Okay, okay, we got it. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.